Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Daily on the Gruley True Sports Network. Inside Boxing Daily, as always, is brought to you by the Retired Box- Boxers Foundation. Boxers Foundation? I sounded like I was from you know Great Britain or something there for a second, didn't I? But make sure you check out Jackie Richardson and Alex Ramos if you want to give to the Retired Boxers Foundation. I am your host for Inside Boxing Daily, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, a man who spent all day looking for Deontay Wilder's or for Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury's Vada testing. Have you found anything yet, Jeremiah? I haven't found anything yet, man. Something fishy is up. Oh, it must mean Fury's fishy. popped hot. Uh oh. Yep. It smells as <clears throat> fishy as a fat girl laying out in a hundred degree heat and jeans. Mm, getting horny there. <laughs> you shouldn't talk like that. That's mean. And I'm fat no, no, shaming no, yeah, people. And this show's about Adam well, this Donatsky. Is a, yeah, this, is a family, <laughs> this is a family friendly show, and we're doing this sick. It's 11 o'clock at night. So, all right. <laughs> we have some boxing to talk about tomorrow night. We got a couple, Will. We got a couple cards. I wouldn't call them good. But let's start over in the old UK where Scott Quigg will fight Jonah Carroll. And, of course, this is going to be a war because they said it was and because Scott Quigg punched Jonah Carroll in the arm. I don't know if they were playing tag your it or what, but this fight is between Quigg, the former WBA Super Bantamweight champion. He has the experience. He has the power. Could Jonah Carroll win this fight? Yeah, I think so. I mean, what the what the hell has Quigg even been doing since the uh... – Oscar Valdez loss. I mean, <clears throat> Quig's a Quig's a decent fighter. I mean, <clears throat> he's a workhorse kind of a guy. Uh, you know, like you said, he does have the power edge here. Joan O'Carroll is pretty much just a work rate kind of a guy. Um, <clears throat> I oh do my like God, you were working man. out again tonight, weren't you? <clears throat> yeah, I, I was, but I'm, I'm, I don't I'm know listening. anybody that does that all the time after they work out. You need to go to a doctor and get that checked out. You need to go down and see a gynecologist. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I've got some. I've got a cough I can't shake. But uh, no, I actually do like the way these. Yeah, uh, yeah. You gotta gotta be careful. Red light district. But uh, yeah, I do like this Styles matchup. I think Quig and Carroll match up well. Carroll is a workhorse kind of a guy. Quig is that kind of a guy as well. But like you said, Quig has the power uh, edge. He's got the experience edge. So it seems natural to favor Quig here. However, Quig has kind of been off the radar ever since he had that war with Oscar Valdez. I mean, he's never really translated at the world-class level. Uh, he was all right with Frampton, you know, but he just he, he's never quite reached it. Again, he was competitive against Valdez, but, you know, Valdez to me is a guy who is a loss waiting to happen. In fact, they announced that, well, he seems to think that his fight with Burchelt is about 95% done. And I think Burchelt is a clearly a notch above Valdez and Valdez is clearly a notch above Quig. So I think they're close. I think Carroll's more like a European level guy. Quig is like a fringe contender type. So I think, I think this will be a good fight. And I do think Quig will earn a decision here. All right. I think he will too. Um, the only thing is, like you said, Valdez is only fight, or since the Valdez fight, he fought Mario Briones in Boston. That's the only fight. That was a, over a year and a half ago, and it's been two years since the Valdez fight. I think that Carroll is a live dog, but I, I wouldn't bet any money on him because the big problem here is Carroll 17 and 0, or 17 and 1 with three knockouts. Yeah, right. And and his big fight was against Tevin Farmer. He was, again, he was real active in it. I mean, he threw a lot of punches. He did land some, but, you know, it was a pretty safe bet for Tevin Farmer because Carroll had hardly any power. But he kept trying. I do like Carroll's attitude. He is a go-getter. He will keep throwing. And, again, I I think the styles match pretty well. I, I think this is a well-made fight. 
Uh, so again, I think it's going to be good, but yeah, I mean, you, you just kind of have to, fi- you know, figure that Quig is going to, you know, come out on top here. But again, it's a good fight. All right, we got on the other card on Fox because I really don't want to talk about Evie Fury. Do you? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, no, I don't. I don't even know who he's fighting. To be honest with no, you, that's how little matter. I care. It doesn't matter who he's fighting, but. He is by far not the best furry, Fury. Um, let's talk a little Effie Ajagba, which he will fight Razvan Kajani, or Kajanyu, tomorrow night. Kajanyu is basically a stepping stone. I think it's probably a step up from, definitely probably a step up from what he's fought. But he has struggled to only go, to go to distance uh, two of his last, what, five or six fights. What's your take on Ajagba? I mean, he looks rock solid so far. I mean, he's a prototypical modern heavyweight, isn't he? He's upright. Uh, you mean he doesn't have a lot of head movement. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, uh, I wouldn't go that far. I'm, I'm uh, again, I'm a bit more lenient when it comes to stuff than you are. But uh, again, we we don't know what his ultimate level is. But he's in the mold of a modern day heavyweight. He's tall. He's upright. He doesn't move his head much. He stays behind the one ones and twos. Uh, and he's looked good so far doing it, you know, but he has shown some vulnerabilities in his last fight. He was, uh, I believe he was dropped by um, uh, God, the the Georgian, and I can't remember his name right now, but he's a bit like Kajanu in the sense that he's a journeyman type. He'll fight anybody. Actually, I think Jagba's last opponent was better than this opponent. So to me, to me, Kiladaz or Kiladaz, something like that. But yeah, something like that. But it, yeah, I mean, uh, Jagbe ended up getting a little too uh, confident in himself. He ended up paying the price for it. He didn't look that hurt, you know. So I'm not too concerned. Uh, but this is a step down from his last fight. I expect Jagbe to get a knockout here. Like you said, his opponent has been. Uh, I think he's lost like his last four in a row or something like that. And I think all by knockout. Maybe no, I'm mistaken there. Correct me if fight. I'm wrong. He, he beat Tamaz oh. Zidoshiva. He was 5-13. and 13. Oh, okay. Okay, well, anybody... But he relevant... had lost these first, or his last four fights before that. Okay, all by knockout? Uh, you know? No, actually, he went to distance with Joseph Parker. He got knocked out by Luis oh, Ortiz. Right. Um, he lost by unanimous decision to Nathan Gorman, and then he got starched, fell, and knocked out by Daniel Dubois. Uh, okay. All right. Now, now it's becoming all clear to me. Anyways, I think this is a step down from uh, Ajagbe's last opponent. So I, I expect an early knockout here. Again, this fight really isn't going to tell us much. Uh, you know, it's just a way of continuously building him, and I think it's fine. I actually think Ajagbe's last. Do you, do you last... think it's a way to compare him to Daniel Dubois and Nathan Gorman and all those guys just because? I, I mean, within the last two years. You know, Kazanu has been in a ring with those guys. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Uh, I think that his promoter is probably looking at it in that sense. You know, if he gets a knockout, an early knockout, yeah, they get to they get to say, hey, well, look at our guy's prog- progression compared to yours. Uh, so, yeah, in a sense, it does make it does make sense to do this. But again, I think it's a step down from. I actually think it's a step down from Ajagba's last two fights. Actually, the Turkish guy that Ajagba fought was pretty competitive and I think yeah. had a strong amateur background. Didn't he knock, did he knock uh, Ajagba down in that fight? I don't think so. I, I think he was a guy who didn't have much power either, but he worked pretty well. I mean, he had some nuance. Again, not, nothing special, but you could see that he had a long amateur background, so there was something to his game. Um, but yeah, that's probably the best guy that Ajagba has fought in his entire career. But yeah, this this should be an early knockout. All right, next up, the main event, we got we got Konatsky against Telanius. Um, Konatsky against Areola. I didn't think he'd look that good, Jeremiah. No, I don't think so either. And I know people, a lot of people chalked it up to Areola showing up in better shape and, you know, getting it together, yada, yada, yada. It's still Chris Areola. It's still Chris Areola. I mean, Chris Areola has had so many handouts in his career, and it's because of who he is. I mean, he's had he's had far too many WBC shots, and there's no secret why. I mean, he's Mexican. The WBC, you, you know, if if by the off chance Areola won it, he would have been, 
you know, the first Mexican to ever win a heavyweight, t- uh, you know, tr- alphabet trinket, you know, that would have been significant for them. That's why the WBC is kicking themselves because, um, you know, their, their belt was not on the line for Anthony Joshua versus um, Andy Ruiz Jr. in the first one. So, yeah, I mean, this, this guy's been getting a lot of handouts and I, I don't, I don't understand why. I mean, he's sort of fun, but he's, I mean, I've seen him lose fights that he's been rewarded, right? He's, I think he's lost fights to much lower. I think Cassie, Fred Cassie is a guy that I thought beat him. It ended up being a draw. Ariel is fun, but this doesn't really provide much. Um, you know, you just hope it's a decent scrap for a little while. And it could be, I mean, I you know, Konaki's not exactly, it's Robert Halani. Konaki's so. not a uh, yeah, yeah, I know, but you know, he Konaki's got knocked not out really... by Gerald Washington like eight months ago. <clears throat> that's true. That's true. But Hellenius was winning. Hellenius was but, winning. But he got I... knocked out. Gerald Washington doesn't look like he could take a punch from my cat right now. Well, he yeah, and, and Gerald Washington just get just did get stopped by uh, uh, by Charles, Charles Martin. Martin. And he Prince, got stopped by it, Prince, him. it made Prince Charles Martin look like he was George Foreman throwing punches in there the way he went down from it. Yeah, yeah. Any, anyways. And don't forget this. He also lost to Johan Duhapis. That's right. Yeah. No, I mean, Hellenius did look like – and again, I I'm, I think I'm getting mixed up here with Ariel and uh, Hellenius, but – um, Hellenius did look like a decent prospect before he hurt his shoulder. He had a pretty good right hand. Again, he was beating Jared Washington for whatever that's worth. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's impossible that Hellenius could win. Konecki has shown a pretty good chin, right? He's taken some bombs, but again, these, this is from guys like Chris Ariola. Uh, I think Hellenius is a sharper puncher than that. Uh, I think Hellenius is just about the same level as Ariola, um, even at this stage, uh, probably at their best, Hellenius might have been a better fighter. Um, not that that matters now. But uh, again, Hellenius could win. He does, still does have punching power. He does have some ability, right? He's pretty good with the one and two. But, you know, you expect Konaki to outwork him and probably bludgeon him and stop him late in the fight. All right, just so you guys know, William Pounds. Who, who thinks Deontay Wilder should be a Hall of Famer and is an all-time great? I offered him to come on the show. And William has not responded. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. He could explain to us yeah. how well, we, you know, he cheated and failed a drug test too. But of course, since none of that happened, hmm, it's hard to explain. Yeah, it's I don't a know. It's a lot easier to type yeah. than it is to talk. Right. Yeah. No. That that's that's perfect. Perfect logic. Well, I don't know. Has uh, has William engaged in the whole uh, glove tampering thing yet? Oh yeah, yeah. William's fully bought in because that's what people do when they get upset. And I had one guy that hey, who who message or sent me a or, or put a message up on air, and I argued with him, and I said, you know, you need to quit being whiny little bitches because Tyson Fury was better. And he goes, well, when Wilder knocks Fury out, you're going to be really upset. And I put, no, I'm not, because I'm not the one getting knocked out. I don't even know Tyson Fury, so I'm probably not going to carry it on for weeks. Yeah. I don't think you or I care enough to, to cry about it or mope around about it. I mean, we, did, we didn't hang our hats on, you know, whether Fury won, even though we hope so. I mean, this wasn't some devastating loss. You know, Fury isn't, unlike Deontay Wilder, Fury is not acting like the king of us. So, you know, there's no, yeah. right? You know what I mean? There's, He's not uh, our leader the way your yeah. king will be back, people. Your king will be back. And Dante... Did you see Dante's Boxing Inferno? Did you see where, I forget who it was that put the message up that he actually bought his wife from overseas. Is that right? Yeah. What the hell? And you'd almost have to because he's fat as hell. Yeah. Hold on. Was this, uh, who's his wife? Uh, I haven't I seen know, her. I don't, I don't follow just, the channel, so I don't know. I, I don't want to give up complete names and stuff, but it, it was Eric, who we both know, that I, I believe said that he paid for his wife overseas. And you'd almost have to because, you know, he's, well, I mean, it's just, he's, he's really big. I mean, he took up two seats at the Broner fight that I covered, and he did nothing but sit there with his hand down his pants fiddling around. And then every once in a while, he'd make a video. Yeah, and then smell his hand. 
Well, I think that actually his belly was so big and it went over everything. I think he was tr- trying to make sure that his, you know, his thing was still there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's a that's a legitimate concern. But and it, if, yeah, and if Dante, well, you know, this this is the joke my son always made because I, I had a guy that coached with me one time who was really big. This would have been like a long, long time ago. Oh, it makes me think of when. That makes me think of when Tyson Fury sung after he knocked out Deontay Wilder and bludgeoned him a long, long time ago. I can still remember how that used to, be, used to make me smile. And that fight makes me smile, too, especially every time I, I get on the Internet and see how much it really bothered people. I find that hilarious. But my son, you, he, he would smack himself on the belly when a, when a real overweight guy would go by and ask him, what are you doing? And he said, well, that, that's how fat people masturbate. Huh. You just smack yourself on the belly real quick because you can't really reach it because the belly's covering it. And then to do it, it would take two hands. You'd have to hold your belly up with your left hand and do it with the right. And that would be way too much effort for somebody that fat. Yeah, so no, that's, that's why I try to stay trim. I mean, you know, masturbating... Is an essential. It's an essential part of my life, and so I got to make sure that there's well, no impediment between. Well, after Tyson Fury between. said, I, I I would like William to know that since Tyson Fury said that he did that seven times a day, that all white people now do that seven times a day. Yeah, undoubtedly. I mean, it's it's been a he's been a beacon of hope. Uh, again, in terms of masturbation for all white people. I mean, I I try to do I try to do what I can, but unfortunately, I'm married, so I got to save some for the wife. Yeah. I'm married too. I don't do that stuff anymore. Yeah. Um, all right. So where was I? <laughs> you can tell it's Friday I don't night. Know, we, were t- we're... we haven't yeah, done a show we're on a Friday about... night in a long time, and they just kind of go to hell. If Konatsky yeah. wins, Konatsky, Andy Ruiz, that fight would sell. Yeah, that, that'd be a good fight. I'd like to see it stylistically. It's fun, but – does it happen? I don't know. I mean, there's been rumors floating around that Andy Ruiz is going to fight Luis Ortiz. I don't know what the deal is, but I think that's a good matchup. I'd really like to see it. Um, but whoever wins is, is going to have to wait in line because, you know, we're, we're going to get the third fight between Fury and Wilder. And then, you know, Anthony Joshua is obviously going to be on the radar. And so, and Dillian White is probably going to get the first crack. So, it's going to be interesting to see. It, it may be Konaki might have to stay busy for a while yeah. because I, I don't think he might he Ruiz. might just have to. Ortiz is much safer for Ruiz, and they're going to want to get a they're going to want to get the Mexican a heavyweight title shot again soon. Well, yeah, and you got to think it from the PBC point of view too. Ortiz is on the way out. You know, Ruiz is more relevant than ever, even though he just lost. I mean, a lot of people jumped off the bandwagon, and rightfully so, by the way he showed up and and didn't do himself uh, he didn't do himself much justice by showing up overweight and and you know boxing the way he did. But he's still more relevant relevant than ever because I mean, when you think of the guy's story, top rank essentially put him on the shelf, and he was put in as a backup to Jarrell Miller and upset the apple cart. So he's done he's done well for himself. And again, he's going to be a relevant player just because of his name and what he was able to accomplish in that one fight. Konaki is a damn good fight. It, it, he, Konaki and Ruiz may have to go the Dillian White route or they'll just have to keep fighting other good heavyweights and collecting paydays that way. Because, because again, the expectation for the top of the division now is, you know, granted Fury gets by the third fight with Deontay Wilder. Dillian White has been waiting for a shot for a long time. So, you know, he's going to be close in line. And then Anthony Joshua matchup for all the marbles, that's going to be in play too. So, you, you know, somebody like Konaki or Andy Ruiz or any of these guys really, probably besides Dillian White, um, or, you know, if Povetkin happens to beat him, he, he'll be in play too. You know, uh, you know, I don't want to make it sound as if White is a, a given there, but it just seems like Konaki and you know, a lot of these other guys are going to have to play the waiting game. So I they might as well just fight. Konaki would be a great fight. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see Andy Ruiz versus Deontay Wilder personally, but uh, you know that would be that would have to be after the third Fury fight, obviously. I would like to ask to never have to see Luis Ortiz fight again. Is that fair enough? Yeah, but he is. I mean, his performance against Deontay Wilder was good enough to where he's going to linger around and he's going to provide some decent fights for some up and comers. Uh, you know, I couldn't see somebody like Adam Konaki against him. 
That doesn't seem like a route that they would go, but Ruiz? I think Konaki would start him. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's tough to say. I mean, what you know, D, Ortiz is obvious. He's probably older than he says, but after getting starts like that again against Deontay Wilder, it's like, who knows what he has? That's what you know, I mean. Konaki Plus, might be a remember this. Ortiz did not look good against Christian Hammer. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, but but he did look good against Deontay Wilder for whatever that's worth. No, he it doesn't. Didn't. Not the second time he did. Yeah, he just he did. stood there and looked at each other. Well, he, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to sit here. And, and he lost to Deontay Wilder, and Deontay Wilder, even though he's the king of all people that aren't white, he still is not any freaking good, which is what I've said for four or five years. Yeah, I know. Uh, all I'm getting at is that Konaki and Ruiz and these other guys are just going to have to go the Dillian White route. They're just going to have to keep fighting each other, fighting other relevant heavyweights, collecting paydays, and just waiting for their turn in line. It's just the heavyweight division is becoming more solidified. It's not being broken up. The only thing that I could see that might shake this up is if, is if Tyson Fury actually sticks to his game plan and he only does three more fights let's say retires with the the Joshua fight and then, you know, everything's broken up and uh, goes to pieces. You know, that's probably when they're going to have to wait their turn. You know, Alexander Usyk, I've heard Eddie Hearn say that, you know, maybe he might be an impediment to a quote unquote undisputed championship between Fury and, and Joshua because he might command one of the belts beforehand. I don't, I don't know, man. You, you never know with, boxing and the politics and stuff but it, it just feels like the division's getting tighter and konaki's just outside on the outside looking in for now all right canelo alvarez will be battling wbo yeah right like billy joe saunders is really a super middleweight champion in less than three months from now on cinco de mayo um is this a dangerous fight for canelo Dan- no, nah, I don't. I don't think dangerous. I, I, I think wouldn't use is. that word. I mean, it's. I, I it's think a, it could be. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I mean, Saunders is a good fighter. I mean, I I, I used to like him quite a bit, and I, I, I've already said this. I think I said this Monday, because uh, I was listening. To, what, what show was I listening to today? Actually, I think I was listening to our show from either Monday or Tuesday. I think it was about when we were talking about Joshua and Pulev. And uh, we were speculating as to, uh, you know, who Canelo may fight and what Billy Joe Saunders may do if Canelo chooses Callum Smith. And, um, yeah, I think this is a good fight. I really do. I mean, I used to like Billy Joe quite a bit when he was – and, again, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Yeah, when he was active and he was beating guys like Jared Fletcher and Chris Eubank. And, again, he was, he was actually fighting some up-and-coming guys and he was winning – uh, you know, when he beat Chris Eubank Jr., I, I, I instantly gravitated towards him because, you know, Chris Eubank Jr. just seems like a – he seems kind of like a bitch, yeah. you know, so – Deontay Wilder's and like the, stepson. You know, yeah, you know, Eubank just – he was acting cocky, and you could see that his father was rubbing off on him. But, you know, Chris Eubank Jr., he's, he's good for what he is. I mean, he's amounted to something pretty solid for being the son of a pretty good fighter, but he, he's not his father. Anyways, Billy Joe beat him. I was happy about that. You know, after the Lemieux schooling, I was like, oh, man, this this guy's pretty good. I think he's a top five middleweight. And then he's become inactive. He doesn't seem like he's that dedicated. It's just become disappointing. I mean, but the thing about it is 168 is so weak. You know, if if you don't count Canelo Alvarez – uh, you know, and, and Danny Jacobs just entered, so it's it's getting better now. And, of course, Alvarez's inclusion does make it more interesting. But when you look at the guys who are actually fighting, who are actually dedicated to 168, Callum Smith, are, most people saw him lose to John Ryder. And I think John Ryder already lost to Billy Joe Saunders. You know, so it's like Billy Joe might be the best 168-pounder in the world. Of course, Callum Smith is ranked number one. Because, you know, because of the decision against Ryder and, you know, he's in the WBSS and, and, you know, ended up winning the tournament and whatnot. But it's just it's a pretty weak division. And until Caleb Plant and Benavides fight each other, there's not a whole lot of clarity. So this might be the best super middleweight in the world. I don't know. Billy Joe has looked pretty. He, he's looked unimpressive at 168. He's getting rocked by guys he shouldn't. He's struggling with guys he shouldn't. 
So uh, in my opinion, he should show up light. I think Billy Joe should show up closer to the middleweight limit, get tighter, get quicker, and and just more active. He's going to have to throw a lot of punches if he wants a chance to win here. All right. I just wanted to bring up, I always wanted to work for the Weather Channel, and I wanted to bring up that San Diego, like a half hour ago, was hit with a 5.5 magnitude earthquake. Is that right? I have not heard that one. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, we, we got a couple comments here on Spreaker and Liam says Saunders is a waste of talent. I really need some reading glasses. If his body would always be in good shape, this guy would be a world-class defensive counterboxer with KO abilities in later rounds, but his stamina is weak, is weaker than Canelo's. Saunders don't like throw long combinations. Did, did Deontay Wilder put his name as Liam and write in? If his stamina would be better, he could easily move circles 12 rounds long. But Canelo is not Lemieux. Canelo will win easily five points. Yeah, I think that's a safe pick. You know, Canelo by points. I mean, Billy Joe has shown that, you know, he's he's slick. I mean, you know, you look at the copy box numbers for whatever they're worth, and I think, you know, Billy Joe and uh, Lomachenko and uh, Demetrius Andre, there's they're some of the – Technically, according to Connect percentage against them, there's some of the best. Of course, Lomachenko sticks out because he's fought the best opposition. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Billy Joe has been kind of disappointing. It just doesn't seem like he wants it as bad as he should. You know, and because of the failed drug test, I was actually hoping that he wouldn't get this payday. I mean, it sucks to see guys who cheat in boxing, you know, get big paydays like this. But, you know, if Saunders shows up at his very best, you know, he's working hard. I, it, it is an interesting fight still, you know, but if it, Liam is, is not far off here, I'm just hoping that we get the best Saunders possible. And, you know, he's got to make the most of this opportunity, man. I don't want him to show up looking lazy, a little flabby around the waist, not, you know, not as active as he should be. He's really got to step it up here. Yeah, because I think this, his style at its best is a style that's always given Canelo trouble, correct? You know, a mover box. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like Austin Trout. Yeah. Trout. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, and that here's my thing is, I mentioned this on Facebook too, but I am not convinced that Billy Joe Saunders is on the level of Arizlani Lara. I think Lara is a superior boxer to Billy Joe Saunders. And again, Billy Joe has not looked as good at 168 as he did at 160. So there's a, there's a lot of hesitation on my part to say, hey, yeah, Billy Joe's got a good shot. I mean, it it is boxing. It's just you match up their styles. Billy Joe doesn't throw enough. He's slick. You know, Canelo is willing to let guys go the distance. You know, he's not a he's not a real killer. Um, you know, he can get guys out of there, but he's not, he's not the kind he'll let a guy get to the finish line if he has to. It's like, you know, you look at the fights against Danny Jacobs and Austin Trout and Laura and all these other guys, you know, he's, he's not out there trying to murder him or anything. He's not really finishing that strong. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, the matchup to me seems like a Canelo victory on points, but I know it would be a huge victory if Billy Joe could pull it off. The problem is going to the scorecards. We know that's unlikely. Yeah. All right. Even if he turns out his best performance ever. Hey, you want to do a throwback and do it on this day? Yeah, man. If you got something good, let's do it. I got something good. I got Wilfred Benitez becomes the youngest champion in boxing history at the age of 17 by beating Antonio Cervantes in 1976, March 6. Yes, sir. Yeah, I posted about that. I mean, I think it's a damn good achievement. I've never been that high on Antonio Cervantes. Um, you know, I do think he was a great 140 pounder for what that's worth. I just don't think he was a great fighter, but I mean, a kid at 17 and not only that, I, I watched the fight. Uh, you know, I had somebody tell me that he was ringside for it, you know, and, and they were, you know, the Puerto Ricans were ecstatic at the achievement because this was in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, random people were hugging each other because of it. I thought Benitez won clearly. I mean, I thought it was sort of close, I think, in about the first four or five rounds. But I thought, you know, B Benitez took over. And I, I, I really didn't agree with the judges' 
the the one judge's scorecard. I, I I really didn't see a split decision there. I thought Benitez won clear enough. I think it kind of tarnishes the victory a little bit. Again, you, you know, people who haven't seen the fight and they go on box rec and they're like, oh, it must have been must have been close because it was a split decision. I thought Benitez was clearly his. It superior. was competitive. It wasn't yeah, yeah, close. yeah. It was, and and yeah, this it was, is the thing. From what I remember, the first four rounds were about even, and then about the fifth round, Benitez seemed like he got real comfortable. And I think he won every round up until about the 11th, as you can tell. I watched it today. And I think he lost the 11th and the 12th. I think he won the rest of the round. So I would have had it 11 to 4. And the thing that was really a bitch is the judge that scored it, you know, for Cervantes. Had it 147, 145, which means he had it like five rounds to three and seven rounds even. Yeah, how the hell? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I just I didn't understand that. Uh, I mean, and I don't I I can't remember what the background of the judge who scored a split decision was, but I, it just came always came across as an oddity to me because Benitez just seemed like the clear better guy, and that was my thing about Cervantes too. Is you know I know this this talk is mostly about uh, Benitez, but Cervantes to me just didn't seem like he could hang with the very best of his contemporaries. I mean, he was you know practically shut out against Lochi apparently. Uh, you, you know, I thought he was clearly beaten by Benitez. He was stopped by Pryor. Yeah, but he uh, so did again, beat he was, Esteban de Jesus and Hector Thompson, who were both good fighters. Yeah, Thompson was a good fighter, and a so good fighter. Uh, yeah, he he was. I mean, I I actually did watch the de Jesus fight. Can I, you find I don't that know, years ago, and, because I can only find it in Spanish. It drives me nuts to watch him like that. I don't know. I think it was in Spanish. Yeah, I mean, but de Jesus to me looked his ass. He knocked him down three times. <clears throat> yeah, I, but De, I do remember some of that fight. I remember De, De Jesus had some bouts of success. I remember he was good at fainting Cervantes and connecting. I think it was with a right hand from time to time. But I don't know. He just – I don't know if it was – he just didn't adjust to the weight class or didn't train. I don't know. I just – I didn't feel like De Jesus was 100 percent there. And it, it was – you know, I don't know. It just didn't seem like – he was Cervantes was beaten the best version of De Jesus and De Jesus, De Jesus was probably best at 135. I don't know. I just I didn't feel like I was getting the best Esteban that night, and so it kind of took some of the luster off it for me. But yeah, I mean Benitez was an excellent boxer. I mean to do that, you know, and Cervantes was the champion at 140 pounds when when Benitez did that. So Benitez became the junior welterweight champion of the world. And so to me, that sticks out as a remarkable achievement, even though I don't like the super slash junior divisions. The fact that he became the man at 17 years old is excellent. And, you know, of course it makes you wonder because you see a lot of these boxing guys put these graphics together or something else or ask questions, start discussions, and they're saying, hey, what what are some of the records that will never be broken in boxing? And Benitez winning a real championship at 17 is going to be a real tough one to break. Yeah, I mean, Americans, I don't even think are allowed to fight professionally that early, are they? No, you ha- well, you have to be 17. So you would have to go straight from like the Olympics to, you know, a, a real title shot. I mean, in Mexico, you can go er, pro as early as 15. I I don't know if it's different in Puerto Rico because I know, you know, Benita, that wasn't Benita's first fight. He had been around for a few years before that. So, uh, you know, maybe it's different in Puerto Rico. But, yeah, I mean, you would have to look to one of those countries to get it done real early. And, uh, that, again, it, it, for somebody to do it 16 well, would be. And the other thing is this. Loche beat Cervantes by a decision, but then Cervantes stopped Loche in the second fight. <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I've obviously seen everything Loche has been in because I wrote about his career. I, I think that was a faded Loche. That stoppage was, I think, via cut. God, uh, now you sound like cut. Deontay Wilder fans. No. Well, what I'm saying, <laughs> No. Uh, what, I know, okay. I'm just messing listen, with listen, I'm not, I'm not getting that crazy. It's just, you, you know, what I saw, I just saw an older Lochi. He didn't look like he was in the fight as much. He had a bad cut. And I actually didn't think it was as one-sided as the scoring indicated. Uh, you know, Cervantes was just, this is why I never thought that highly of him. Because when you watch him against the best, you know, like you watch the fights with Lochi and Benitez, he's constantly pumping out the jab. But, That's you know, brilliant. against guys like, yeah, against De Jesus, you know, the right hand was good, 
But he, I, I, I don't know, man. Against the best guys, it was really just a bunch of jabs. I think this. I think you undersell him a little bit, but not that much. Um, I mean, Peppermint Frazier was a solid win. Uh, Miguel Montilla was a very good fighter who he beat twice. He beat Saul Mombi. He beat Hector Thompson, who gave Duran trouble for a little bit. He beat De Jesus. And it was 1975, so it wasn't like it was after the third Duran fight and he'd been all worn out. And then he loses to Aaron Pryor, did put Pryor on the ground once. I think he was a very good champion. And that's about it, though. But Wilfred Benitez, to me, is an all time great fighter. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously, you look at Benitez's career and you feel like he left something on the table because of his training habits. Uh, but he, he was a great. I mean, look what he did against Duran. And of course, you know, whatever you bring that up, Duran wasn't this, Duran wasn't that. Dude, I can't Duran was you know, in that shape on... that night. There wasn't no baby fat on his ass. He knew he was fighting. He just couldn't deal with Benitez. Benitez was better than him that night. Yeah, well, I know, man. It's it's just like whenever you get with some of the Duran fanatics, and don't get me wrong, you know, Duran was a great fighter, but he, he got beaten clearly by Benitez. Benitez was that good. Uh, I mean, you just look at his fights against Leonard and look at his fight against Hearns. I mean, the guy was obviously a great fighter. But yeah, I mean, and that's sort of the gulf there is like when you look at Benitez, he just falls short against the, you know, the very best besides Roberto Duran. And I think he's just like clearly a notch better than, you know, Cervantes. So again, I I do think Cervantes is a very good fighter. I just, you know, like if somebody puts him number one at 140 all time, I'm just I'm like, nah, I wouldn't go that far. Well, see, I mean, thing, he deserves the, to be. The thing that amazes me when you look at the scorecards for Duran and Benitez Dave Moretti, 144-141. Lou Tabbitt, 145-141. Hal Miller, 143-142. I watched yeah. that fight a few months ago, and I think it was more like 12-3. to 3. I mean, It was an ass whoop. Yeah. He dominated that fight. Yeah, I think I had it 10-5, to 5, but it, you know, it, that, that fight's kind of fuzzy to me. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought Benitez clearly won. I mean, regardless, he beat Roberto Duran. I mean, that tell, tons of people would put Roberto Duran in their top, you know, five, yeah. at least 10 all time. And Benitez shows, showed that he was classy that night. And if it really was Roberto Duran who, you know, didn't have a good training camp or he didn't show up 100% for some reason, why, I don't know. Why didn't he de- demand the rematch? Why did, why did we never get a second fight if... You, you, right. Uh, I, I don't know. I've, I've never heard this question asked. And so may, maybe, you know, I don't know. Like, why was there never a second fight if Duran really was not 100 percent that night? Was there ever any talk about it? No, because Duran didn't want a second fight. I don't believe. Yeah, I, he, probably, really he didn't don't. want to fight somebody I mean, stylistic. Was, like that. Yeah, it was a one sided domination. And then the fight after that, I think Benitez really proved how great he was because he gave Thomas Hearns all kind of trouble. And the thing I remember about that fight is Don King actually asked both fighters to take a pay cut, and they both took like a quarter of a million dollar pay cut. And that fight was at the Superdome in New Orleans, and Don King was hoping to attract 40,000 people. Unfortunately, I think it was like 10,000. The fight was on HBO. It was also on pay-per-view at like 150 closed-circuit locations. And the undercard, Wilfredo Gomez and Lupe Pintor is one of the great fights nobody ever talks about. And then Hearns Benitez was a damn good fight. Benitez got knocked down, I think, like the fifth or sixth round. And he got back up, and he fought hard. And, you know, in the ninth round, he scored what a TV replay showed to be a phantom knockdown. But he went in there, and he actually fought Thomas Hearns. And Thomas Hearns, I think people forget, was a great boxer. And if you don't believe he was, watch rounds like 6 through 10 or 6 through 12 against Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah, or you can just go watch him beat Virgil Hill at 175 on his boxing ability. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously he was a great boxer. Every, you know, people remember from his punch, but he's like the pinnacle – of string bean fighters, you know, the tall skinny guys, he's, he's the pinnacle of that style. I mean, he could box, he could fight, you know, even when he got knocked out, he acted like he never did. I mean, he was, he was excellent, but Benitez back to Benitez, Benitez was very close to, he was around that level. I mean, when you, when you just match up the pairings, like what he did to Duran, what Leonard did with Duran, you know, and, you know, just all these guys in their round table, 
fights. I mean, you know, Benitez was was near that level. Again, I do feel like he he left something on the table because he didn't train like he should have, uh, which is disappointing. But he was a phenom. He was an excellent fighter. And like you said, he was an all time great. Yeah. And usually young phenoms burn out quickly. And I mean, he went almost the entire distance with Ray Leonard. And I always thought when they called it a fab four, I think it should have been a fab five, because I think that the Wilfred Benitez that fought Thomas Hearns January 30th in 1982 against Marvin Hagler would have went the distance and given Hagler trouble just like Duran did, maybe more. Yeah, that is an interesting one. I, I haven't seen that question posed very much, though I assume a lot of people would say that, you know, Hagler is just too big and physical and, you know, probably wears him out and stops him late, but that would have been an interesting fight. Well, I would have much reason, rather seen that. The reason that. I bring it up, though, is because... I remember December of 82 against Thomas Hearns, and that's what everybody thought would happen when he stepped in the ring with Hearns. And yeah. to go farther, at middleweight, I mean, Mustafa Hamshow whooped his ass by, I think it was a 12-round decision, but Hamshow was a really strong dude. And Benitez, I mean, he clearly got beat. But, I mean, it wasn't like he was completely dominated in the fight. I think it was like a 117, 111, and that was at middleweight. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and that, that was Benitez's problem, too. He just he didn't keep it together. I mean, his best days were at 147. But, I mean, you know, he accomplished a lot for, you know, his career. You still got to give him his, his – I mean, resting your hat – on those performances, still a damn good thing. I mean, he lost fights. He probably shouldn't have, <clears throat> but again, he just, he just didn't keep it together. But I mean, yeah. he beats, he beats Cervantes at 17. I mean, you know, that's, that's, a, a, it's a historically relevant thing. I mean, that's why so many people bring it up, you know, because it's one of those records because a lot of boxing records are just out of reach. You know, it's like hall of famers fought well, you, you know, with, with the rate they put hall of famers in, but like Len Wickwar and the, uh, you know, his 339 wins or whatever it is, you know, like that's at a distance, but you know, Benitez's win at 17 is, is one of those that gets put, you know, in the category of unbreakable records. So, you know, Credit to him for it. Yeah, and I also think that he punched harder than what people gave him credit for because his knockout of Maurice Hope to win the junior middleweight title in, I think it was 1982 or 83, was a great punch. I think he was a guy that just oh, yeah. went out with Blast the intention him. of, yeah, I think he was a guy that just went out with the intention of outboxing people and doing enough to win. Yeah, yeah, I think he's a lot of like a lot of boxers. They just don't commit to it because it's not on their DNA. You know, Benitez was like that, where he was perfectly content making guys miss and you know making them look stupid. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. He could hit because if he didn't punch a little bit, you know, guys like Duran and others would just bowl over him. He had some sting in his shots. Technically, he was good. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it just wasn't in his DNA to really go out there and blast guys. So yeah, you didn't, you didn't really get much of that, but the hope knockout was excellent. I mean, he, he blasted him. Um, you know, and he, I, I actually watched the Pete Ranzani fight, uh, a few months back too. And I mean, he was just uh, like much better than Ranzani. Actually, he, he, he was excellent that night. I mean, you, you look at the best Benitez and he's, he's obviously beat, but well, but the best Benitez, uh, let me ask you something. The best Benitez doesn't beat Montreal Durant, does he? I mean, what, what do you think the best, who do you think the best Benitez beats? None of those guys. Those guys, I mean, well, you mean Durant, what, at what weight? It, it, it 147. At 147. Ever. No, I because I, I believe this. I don't believe Roberto Duran's a top 10 welterweight of all time. And I don't think Joe Frazier's a top five heavyweight of all time. But I think on that night in Montreal, much like Frazier's one night, March, what, 15th, 1971, or March 8th, 1971 at Madison Square Garden, that on those nights, those guys were as good as anybody I ever saw. And they, I mean, he was basically, looked like he was possessed. There was no way he was going to lose that night. I will tell you this, though. Any other night of his career, I don't think he beats Wilfred Benitez. So that's a one-off where he was perfect that night when he had to be. And, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard wasn't too far from perfect because that fight was damn near dead even. I mean, that's a one- or two-point fight when you watch it. It's not the one-sided ass-whipping that people will make you think it was. It was one of the greatest fights of all time. 
Um, but so to me, I, I see all these people that rank Duran really high. But to me, Borja Benitez beats him every time. Now, if I'm going to go pound for pound at lightweight, throwing that in, then yeah, I would rank Duran as better as him. But from 140 up, 140 to 154, I'm going to take Benitez every time. I just think his style would almost always beat Roberto Duran. Well, yeah, I, I think historically when you look at the landscape, you know, and you pair the best Benitez at 147 with some of these other guys, it's like, well, he probably doesn't beat Robinson, probably doesn't beat Ray Leonard, but, you know, Henry Armstrong, Joe Col- Walcott, you, you know what, though? Barney Everybody Ross. Everybody says all the great things about Sugar Ray Robinson, but I don't think there's anybody that would have had an easy time against Wilfred Benitez. No, I don't think so either. I feel I feel the same way about Thomas Hearns at 147. I mean, Robinson was obviously fantastic. You know, most people think that he's – historians, that is mostly what I'm pointing at, yeah. think he's the best fighter ever. And again, but the thing about it is nobody's probably having an easy time with Benitez. But, it, like, really, if you look past the top two or three, right – so you have Robinson, Leonard, you know, the Montreal, Duran. And then, but then you get guys like Henry Armstrong, not his natural class, Barney Ross, Kid Gavlin, Emil Griffith, you know, Jose Napoles. I actually think Benitez versus Napoles is a very interesting fight. Uh, I think Benitez may beat him. The, the only reason I say may is because uh, Napoles, unfortunately, the welterweight division was pretty weak when he was the champion. And, I mean, Armando Muniz whooped his ass. And got completely yeah. screwed. And Muniz was a hell of a fighter, but I think Benitez was better. So I would take Benitez over Napoli's. Yeah, no, I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Outside, like, four guys, you know, Thomas Hearns, Leonard Robinson, you know, the best ran. Benitez has a real shot at with any of these guys. I mean, Emil Griffith, I mean, I think Griffith was excellent, you know, but you could say that Griffith never. I think besides one fight, he really struggled with Luis uh, Manuel Rodriguez, who is another Puerto Rican that, you know, Rodriguez versus Benitez would be excellent too. But yeah, I think, but you know, the best Benitez has a, uh, he's a live dog against, you know, some of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. I think there is a definite case. You could put him in the top 10 welterweights. The only reason I may not, because he really didn't stay at welterweight that long. I mean, because he didn't fight Tommy Hearns at welterweight. He fought him at junior middleweight. He fought Cervantes at junior welterweight if you know what I mean. So I, I think he was definitely one of the greatest fighters I ever saw. And when people say that he was really boring, I saw him in some pretty good fights. And I, I don't think everything he did was boring. You watch him against Maurice Hope, that wasn't boring. You watch him against Tommy Hearns, he didn't run from Hearns, and that's why it was a 15-round decision. I mean, he, he fought Hearns. And that was Hearns when he decided he wanted to beat a Motor City Cobra which was different than the hitman, which was dumb as hell anyways. But remember this, Roberto Duran was scared to death of Hearns, and he got knocked out in two rounds. Benitez was there 15 rounds later, and he'd won five or six rounds. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah, I, I just don't think Benitez probably stayed at 147 for very long because I think he got beat by Leonard, and then it's maybe he just didn't feel like – he had much of a shot beating Leonard, so maybe he just moved up. I don't know why he chose no, that career I, I think path. It was I more just... that he didn't always like to train real hard, so it was easier to just add on the weight and fight at the next division. Yeah, figured his natural talent would get him through. Yeah, and it did most times. But the yeah. problem was that only lasted till he was about twenty three or twenty four, and then that was pretty much it for him. Okay. Well, well, the the one, one big relevant question before you know we change tune. Yes, but he uh, would have beat Deontay but, Wilder. Go ahead. No, no, no. Well, you're close. You're you're getting hot actually. Not Wilder. I'm not. Yes, uh, we're Benitez talking about a welterweight. Beat Earl Spence. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, no. Earl Spence has done you're nothing. Hotter. To, put it like this: Earl Spence has done. Uh, Terence Crawford has done nothing to belong in the same conversation with Wilfred Benitez, that's not all their fault. It is, I mean, it's a lot of Spence's fault because he could have fought Danny Garcia and all these guys, and he hasn't. But I'm telling you this. If, if Errol Spence is letting Mikey Garcia go to distance with him and he's struggling with Shane Porter, he ain't beating Wilfred Benitez. Yeah, Sean Porter. But still, Spence is not my target here. You're getting close. Let's go uh, a generation back. Oh, okay. And that's the that's fight I'm looking for. So I'm looking for Benitez versus Mayweather. 
I'll take Benitez at welterweight. I think Mayweather is actually a greater fighter, but I think Mayweather's best weight was 126, 135. You mean 130, 135? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's why I only like eight divisions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Stupid junior classes. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah, I, I think that Mayweather was at his best and I'd beat Diego Corrales. I think that was his best weight. I think all time he's a greater fighter, but at welterweight, I think Benitez would have outsmarted him and beat him. You would have had basically two guys waiting to counterpunch each other. But the difference is I think Benitez hit harder. I don't think that Floyd is going to knock out a guy like Maurice Hope at 154 with one punch. Okay. You're on the record, man. And I don't think he's a – well, I could be on the record because they ain't ever going to fight, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I know. What do you think? I know. That's a tough one. I don't know, man. It's tough. I mean, you know <laughs> – how about this? Do you think Floyd Mayweather could stand in a ring for 15 rounds at 154 with Tommy Hearns? I don't think. No, I don't think he could stand at any weight with Thomas Hearns no, and, for and 15 I don't, rounds. I don't think that Sugar Ray Leonard or I don't think Sugar Ray Leonard waits until the 15th round to put away Floyd Mayweather. No, and I don't think so. Either. And that's no. not to say I don't think Wolf or that Floyd Mayweather wasn't a great fighter because I do. I think he was an all-time great fighter. You can't deny that. But there's levels here, and the level of Sugar Ray Leonard, Sugar Ray Robinson, Sam Langford, Harry Greb, Ezard Charles are worlds apart from about anybody else. Yep, absolutely. And I, I just, I'll take Benitez at welterweight, but I think there's no doubt that Mayweather had the better career. He obviously didn't have a hard time staying right. in shape. I'm just saying at the bigger weight, Benitez, I think, was naturally a bigger fighter who hit harder. I think they're going to fight a lot alike. But I think Benitez also, from what we saw against Hearns, can fight coming forward, and he can beat people of different styles. I mean, come on. I mean, is Marcus Maidana going to give Wilfred Benitez trouble? Uh, at 147, no. Nor at 140. No, he's not. And he gave Floyd trouble because Floyd had difficulty with guys that swarmed him. But almost nobody did. But the guys who did, you know, Castillo, Maidana... All gave him trouble. So I, I just think the the ring IQ of Floyd Mayweather is outstanding, but it's not Wilfred Benitez, and that's not Mayweather's fault. The reason Benitez IQ is higher is because he's fighting Antonio Cervantes when he's 17. He's fighting Sugar Ray Leonard when he's 20. He's fighting Roberto Duran. He's fighting Thomas Hearns. So fighting Floyd Mayweather ain't going to be a big deal to him. Yeah. You know? He ain't Conor McGregor or Andre Berto, or even yeah. an old Manny Pacquiao. Now, that's the fight that would be interesting to me. Manny Pacquiao of, like, 2010 against Benitez. Yeah, but, yeah, that would be interesting because Pacquiao's obviously the smaller guy, but he's just, uh, you know, stylistically so dynamic. Yeah, I, I think that actually even though Mayweather better career than Pacquiao, I know Pacquiao beat a lot of people, but he also lost to, you know, six or seven guys. But I think styles make fights, and I think that style would have given Benitez trouble. That would have been a lot of quick angles, a lot of power punching. That stuff Mayweather doesn't do. So I also think this. I think 2010, Floyd would have lost to Manny Pacquiao. And y'all kiss my ass if you don't believe that, because I don't really care. Yeah, I know we've been over this a bunch of times. You know, it's like people are like, oh, well, he beat him, you know, and, and obviously Pacquiao is still very good. But it's it's the I'm gonna, just going to go back to the same example that I've used every time we've talked about this. If Thomas Hearns would have gotten the decision against Ray Leonard and they only had the rematch in the rematch, everybody would have said Thomas Hearns beats Leonard. Right. I mean, most people would have said, oh, well, Thomas Hearns beats Leonard no, no matter when they fight or where oh, they fight. You mean fought, if, they, if he right? would have beat no. him in the first fight? Yeah. No, no. I mean, so oh. if we only got if we only got the Thomas Hearns and Sugar Ray Leonard rematch. OK, you mean no first fight. So the first fight exactly in the second fight. Yeah, exactly. So so, uh, yeah, the, the example I'm trying to use is you get two great fighters past their best in a higher division and most people think Thomas Hearns won, right? So, you know, if we did not get the first fight in that conclusive result, people would have looked at the 
the the the old the lone fight they would have had, and then we're like, oh yeah, Thomas Hearns beats Sugar Ray Le- Leonard whenever. I mean, we don't we just don't know that. I mean, you know, well, don't you think that fight was the way it was because it meant a lot more to Tommy Hearns and his legacy than it did to Sugar Ray Leonard? Yeah, I mean, yeah, probably so. But all I'm saying is, we you can't hang your hat on the result of the the lone Mayweather Pacquiao fight. I mean, you can if you want, but I just don't think it's a definitive result. Uh, like Sugar Ray Leonard Thomas Hearns one was. Yeah, but see, the difference is this. Sugar Ray Leonard Thomas Hearns, when they were in their prime, demanded to fight each other. Pacquiao and Mayweather didn't. Yeah. They making money, making money without each other. Yeah, and the thing is this. If you were going on a purely monetary role here, what they did was right. But it would have been a lot better fight five years before that. Yeah. Because they were both a lot better five years before that. See, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure that Pacquiao beats that and beats Mayweather. I'd like to see it though, because I think it was a fifty-fifty fight because they were both great fighters, and they waited so long that it just wasn't the same damn thing. And now Floyd looks like he's going to fight on the same night. He says he wants to fight like Khabib and Conor McGregor in a boxing matches. That shit's stupid. Yeah, yeah, I don't care about any of that. Well, the thing about it. The thing about it too, whoops. The thing about it too is, um, if they would have fought in their primes for less money, there would have been more incentive to engage. You know, when you're old, an old Manny Pacquiao and you're doing part-time senator duties, you know, you're making music records, you're making movies, you got 45 kids. You know, I mean, well, the, both if, got if you're 45 fighting, 45 kids, don't they? I don't. I think Mayweather has two or three. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. More than that. No, no. I know Pacquiao's gotten all religious, so he's, you know, he's he's really pumping them out. <laughs> but uh, all, all I'm all I'm saying is, when you're in the ring with Mayweather and, and you're not totally engaged in the sport like Pacquiao was back then, you know, it takes some incentive off. I mean, hell, I wouldn't want to chase a guy around for twelve rounds. Hey, all I know is we're making excuses for Pacquiao. He got his ass whipped. I just wish the two would have fought each other sooner. Yeah, yeah I agree. You know, I agree. So. All right. Anything else before we wrap it up? You want to tell everybody where they can find you on the old Twitter? Yeah, don't don't find me. Uh, don't don't bother. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to find me, all you got to do is just look up my name. Find me on Facebook. That's my preferred social media outlet. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at Griffo's Hanky. Uh, you can find the Grueling Truth at Grueling Truth on Twitter, uh, at TGTN Boxing. That's, you know, where our boxing stuff gets put out. Uh, you know, the website, thegruelingtruth.com. Yeah, co- come and conversate. If you think I'm a dumbass, hey, man, just let me know. All right, guys. You can follow me at Grueling Truth. That's it. All right. Um, we will be back Sunday night to talk about the fights, Jeremiah. Yeah, I think so. Unless they, Unless the whole thing blows, but yeah. What thing blows? Yeah, the whole cards, all the cards. Oh, okay. Well, you know they probably will, but we'll still talk about it. It may be William Pounds or one of those, what's it called? The LDC Boxing Community or the Learning Disabled Committee? What, what is it called? Oh, now, now I'm confused. Learn, learning, hold on, LDBC, Learning Disability. Uh... <laughs> Boxing Crackheads? What is yeah. it really called? You said it the other day. It's the first time I'd heard about it. Yeah, I, I, it's uh, Lion's Den Boxing Community. Oh, okay. Lazy, dumbass boxing yeah. community. So if anybody from there would like to come on and talk about why Deontay Wilder's a Hall of Famer and why he got screwed in that fight, you guys can always message us directly at Grueling Truth or at TGT Boxing. And Hamed, if you're listening, find us one of those guys. It'll be fun. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up for now. Um, I want to tell you all, you can listen to us everywhere you find podcasts. And that's pretty much it, including iHeart, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, Rockfin. We're there now. But for now, for Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.